Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here for this press conference. Um, we're going to speak about a very important topic um, in the world, but also in specific, specifically for this region. Um, we're going to have an in-depth look at the state of talent in the Arab world. And we have a distinguished panel here who are experts and who have uh, done a report <coughs> and they will tell us what is the situation in the region um, and they will give us um, their insight and then you will have the opportunity to ask some questions. So I have um, next to me uh, Selim Ide, who is the head of policy and government relations Middle East and North Africa at Google. Um, we have then in the middle here for our panel Patricia McCall who is the exe executive director uh, for the Center of Economic Growth um, at INSEAD. And last but not least, uh, Bruno Lanvin, um, who is the executive director um, at, uh, of the European Competitiveness Initiative at INSEAD also. Uh, we're going to start with Bruno actually to give us the key findings of the report. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody or good afternoon, rather. Uh, the, uh, the report we've been uh, presenting here uh, at the, uh, the Dead Sea meeting of the, the World Economic Forum is the most recent baby of a series of production. Basically, we produce every year the Global Talent Competitiveness Index, which we launch in Davos. So typically in January, you have the global report that ranks 118 countries in terms of their talent competitiveness. The idea behind it is that talent, that is human capital, is what conditions countries' ability to compete on the global scene, their capability to innovate, and the capability to benefit in particular from technological change. Without the right kind of skills, without the right kind of talents, the benefits of technology-driven, data-driven globalization may be lost to large parts of the world. That's the, the background and why we do this exercise every year. The MENA region, Middle East, North Africa region, is the only region for which we have a regional report. So we believe very much that this is the part of the world where things will happen, have started to happen, and may be an example for the rest of the world. There are specific difficulties, there are specific challenges, and specific opportunities, in particular due to demography, the youth of populations in the Middle East regions and Arab countries that makes it a very, very important target for our own research and a very powerful example for the rest of the world. That's, again, the broad picture and why we are launching this report here today. Um, just a very uh, short sentence about the rankings, because this is what attracts press, and we know it from experience. We insist on saying that the rankings are only the tip of the iceberg, and the proof of the usefulness of this report is in action. That is, whether governments, private businesses, academia, individuals use this report to actually change their behavior and enhance their talent competitiveness on the global scene. Right now, in the region, we have ranked the 12 uh, countries that for which we had data uh, in, uh, in the region. And we have at the very top the United Arab Emirates and Qatar, who are leading the, uh, the pack, number one and number two in the region. And they are followed by Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Kuwait. Uh, Jordan uh, is number six in that ranking of, of 12, uh, which reflects the ranking of Jordan in the overall uh, exercise, uh, since uh, Jordan is number 58 out of the 118 countries. So it's quite symptomatic that whatever number you take, you divide it by two, and that's the ranking of Jordan. So maybe Jordan likes to be uh, on the average, not to be, uh, uh, not, uh, to be noticeable, but uh, we'll have time in the discussion to come back to some or the specifics of Jordan as a country in this region and why uh, it is so much of an example for many other countries. I think a very important part is technology. So, uh, Selim, um, can you tell us a little bit um, what role technology plays? Uh, certainly. So, uh, uh, we asked ourselves the question, can the MENA region catch up? And uh, the answer uh, came back uh, as we are all optimists, yes. It is possible, 
as long as we uh, use technology as a game changer. And um, as you know, this audience knows this very well, that uh, technology can change uh, things for the better. So how can this, be, uh, can this happen in the MENA region? Uh, remember, the MENA is um, youth-rich in terms of 60% uh, uh, of uh, uh, the people in MENA are under 25. And that is a source of uh, talent. And the question then, how to turn this talent into uh, uh, competitive, uh, competitive talent? And we discovered uh, through the study that th there is a confusion, people make a confusion between education and talent competitiveness. So talent competitiveness is more than, um, than education. And technology can help at uh, at least three levels so on the classical uh, demand side which is demand for talent and uh, and here we strongly believe that uh, uh, the, to, to digitize the economy meaning uh, with the youth at the core meaning uh, for example 18 percent of the smes are present uh, on uh, uh, on the internet in in the ue which is one of the most advanced uh, uh, it's number one country in the in the ranking, uh, compared to 60% in the EU. So there is a lot to catch up with, and uh, uh, you need to digitize the economy with uh, uh, with SME being the the main driver. That is from a demand point of view. Now, technology. There are new technologies that are coming, like machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. All these will will uh, uh, will contribute greatly as well to the to the demand side on the supply side uh, this is where uh, the confusion happens between education and talent competitiveness uh, preparing people to be competitive uh, you need uh, education plus something else uh, so talent competitiveness is more than education and the report really talks a lot about the, the more part and how technology can empower it. Basically, we, all the experts will tell you that blended learning, uh, meaning mixing uh, online plus instructor-led training plus on-the-job training is critical. This is the way forward. Now, th the only way to achieve it is through uh, extensive use of technology as a game changer in the blended learning um, experience. Uh, also here, um, augmented reality, and uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence can help. The last uh, element is uh, the, the, the intermediary space between demand and supply. This is what we uh, like to call the, the poor cousin. Uh, not, uh, not enough emphasis is given on this, uh, yet we see the role of the platforms globally, how they are creating uh, 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 the right connections between the demand and the supply and actually creating opportunities. Uh, and this is uh, this is extremely important. We can uh, there are many great examples here in the MENA region about about how these platforms are are changing the game, and they are technology platforms. Um, and um, uh, one very important point as well is that here again, machine learning and artificial intelligence is actually uh, accelerating the intermediary space and making it more far more effective. Last but not least, between the two, you have the networks and the connectivity. And uh, throughout this, these two days here, everyone talked about connectivity. So the basic element of it, keeping it simple, is uh, they need uh, uh, we, you need to provide the young people with an increased level of connectivity, actually. High quality internet for all, anywhere, any place, their choice, the choice of the youth. And that will be in, 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 uh, a key element to unlock the potential of the region. Thank you very much, Patricia. You have some dimensions also um, to add from the report. Um. Sure. So, so one of the things that we also focused on, as Salim uh, alluded to, is that talent exists in an ecosystem that is beyond education and, and lifelong learning and executive education. And so one of the aspects of the report focuses on the entire ecosystem around private sector development and how do we encourage economic reform and investment climate reform. So there's four areas that I wanted to highlight. The first is the labor market, as we're all aware that about 30% region-wide of the employed 
um, uh, workforce is in the public sector versus 10% globally. So one of the challenges is how do we move, um, especially the youth, out of the public sector and into the private sector where they can they can be more competitive and um, and more jobs can be created in the SME sector. So that's one of the challenges we highlight. The other is on education. We've spoken a lot about this um, in terms of how does the private sector regional corporations partner with the governments and the ministries of education and the universities. There needs to be collaborative partnership where companies are helping the universities design their curriculums so that they are teaching the youth of the region the skills that they need when they graduate to go into the workforce. So there, there's a host of recommendations in the report about not just lifelong learning, but how to, how to, um, to engage more with education, both K through 12 and universities. I would also highlight the legal framework. So, so in terms of talent competitiveness, there needs to be a competitive environment for job creations. So we still need to look at labor market flexibility, hiring and firing, bankruptcy laws, IP laws, things that create a vibrant private sector so there can be demand for the skills that the youth are developing. And then lastly, I'll point to the entrepreneurship ecosystem. We do, if you look at the variables for each of the countries, we do look at things such as starting a business, how easy is it to get access to finance, research, patents, all of the areas around developing entrepreneurs and, and how, how we can facilitate better growth within not just SMEs, but young entrepreneurs and, and those opportunities for the youth. Um, there's several other issues that we talk about in the report about the private sector role, and I think it's important to make sure that this talent competitiveness is both a government, but also a private sector issue. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, thank you um, to all the panelists. We have now um, time for questions. Um, if you, if you want to ask a question, please introduce yourself and, and to who you want to address the question. We have about um, 10 to 15 minutes. Do we have an immediate question here, here in the panel? Yes, please. Please wait for the microphone. Okay, my name is Lara Abdel Malak. I work for Pan Arab Business Magazine, Sado Amal. My question is, why did, uh, why did you Google uh, decide to do this uh, research and how does that bring back either to the business or your efforts in the MENA region? Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Lara. Great question. So um, uh, why we're here is because uh, this report has unique um, aspects. First of all, you know, in the Middle East, we, we all have opinions. We come to the table and we discuss at length and it's always fascinating. Uh, and it's good to come to results. So this report is data rich. It has a lot of data if you go through it. And uh, when data comes to a meeting, actually it speaks for itself. And hopefully people will start uh, a, a constructive conversation that will lead somewhere. I, I give you an example, a personal one. You know, I'm originally from Lebanon, as you know. And uh, Lebanon ranks number eight in, in this, which is, which is difficult to accept. But I have to look at the reality and then start the conversation hopefully that will lead to a, an improvement uh, of the situation. The other aspect of that is that, um, is that this is actually, uh, uh, we mentioned that uh, talent is more than education and, and really, really uh, th this, uh, uh, this report puts an emphasis also on youth and youth is the most valuable resource and, and, and actually it will, will transform things. Now how does it link to what we're doing and this is your question, is that we are, uh, we are engaged uh, in, across the MENA region in uh, building digital skills at various levels. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Like in Egypt, we've launched the mobile uh, application uh, uh, launching pad, MAL, with we, we, um, abbreviation for MAL. And we were there in um, uh, last uh, in, in March. And uh, 1,300 uh, young people, if you can see the energy in the room, Actually, as you know, mobile application is one of the best jobs, uh, paid jobs uh, in, in, in the U.S. It's one example. The other example, we're building digital literacy in, in Saudi Arabia, and this is helping uh, uh, kids to be safer on the Internet. A third one is uh, digital skills in, uh, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, uh, where, where we, we sort of trained so far 50,000. The aim is to uh, train 250,000 
uh, 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 young people on uh, on coding. So this is uh, the new literacy, the, the new literacy of the 21st century. Thank you very much. And and just maybe to remind you that the report is now launched, so you you will be able to consult it. There's a few copies here, and uh, you can get a e copy um, from from our colleagues who, who are here in the in the room. So we had two other questions. Uh, maybe can we start here in the front? Um, yes, Jinan uh, Shkair from uh, Yermuk Press and Yermuk University. Um, you said talent is more than just education. But we can't embrace talent if we don't improve education. So how do you see improving education considering the lack of um, potentials in our, uh, especially in our pe public sectors in university? Thank you. May, may Bruno, would this one? Like to uh, that? Thank you very much. Excellent question again. Um, one should not make a confusion between education and formal education. Uh, clearly, formal education remains extremely important. You need to go uh, through basic skills to acquiring the ability to uh, read, write, and now code, which we believe is a fundamental basic uh, capability that needs to be developed very early. That's the formal education part. But we are not living anymore in a world where the first part of your life was about getting an education and the second part was about working. This is a lifelong uh, type of education that we are looking forward to. Uh, and each and every one of us, uh, whatever our age, whatever our, our gender, will need to continuously upskill. So we need to learn continuously. This is where education is, and it's far beyond formal education. In the Talent Index, we distinguish three parts in what we call talent competitiveness. The first one is to grow talent which is largely education and not just formal education, as I just said. The second one is attracting talent, because not every country has the ability nor the will to develop worldwide universities that will attract people from all over the world to get an education. This is still a very big advantage of the US, of some European economies. It will not change overnight, but there is a possibility to have local people trained outside and come back and contribute. And this has to do with attracting or reattracting talent. And the last one, which must not be neglected and very often is the most important, is how to retain talent. In the GCC, uh, we can think of many economies which have been very efficient at attracting talent, but this has, this has been high caliber talent coming for two, three years, getting some money and going back to live with their family elsewhere. How do you encourage these people to set roots, to come with their family, to live there and contribute to the growth and the competitiveness of the economy? So growing, attracting, and retaining are the three pillars to be considered. And education is clearly a very important part. But as you mentioned, it's not going to be efficient if it's not considered in the overall exercise. And what uh, uh, Patricia just mentioned about the role of the private sector gives a particular role to business school. And of course, I'm pleading for my own uh, chapel here uh, because the um, uh, INSEAD is about that. But what we are trying to do is to show that talent needs to be developed across sectors, uh, that you're not condemned to work all your life in the public sector or all your life in the private sector, and encouraging segues and channeling people between one and the other is critically important. Thank you very much. Uh, we had another question. Uh, unless you, Salim, do you want to add? I, I just wanted to, to add uh, something that would please uh, Bruno is that uh, uh, you know he has a Cartesian mind. So it's uh, we say talent competitiveness is uh, education is necessary but not sufficient, right? In in, in the, from in a mathematical way of, uh, of of saying so. So w that extra thing is is that ecosystem mm -hmm. that. Uh, clearly was articulated. I, I, if you want the formula to illustrate what <laughs> we, we share uh, <laughs> as a passion in common um, about formal education and informal education, think of the difference between science and technology. Okay? And we are fond of saying science is what a grandmother can teach a granddaughter and technology is the other way around. Okay? <laughs> and this summarizes the way we should look at education. Thank you. So we had a second question here. Uh, my name is Hala Abu Hijle. I'm from a Destour Daily newspaper. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, Jordan ranking in the 
uh, index how can uh, jordan per uh, how do you evaluate the performance of jordan and how can it develop uh, regarding uh, regarding uh, partnership between private and public sectors yeah this is typically the kind of questions we hope to get into through this report. We want to encourage countries to bring the findings in their own national context. So I can only be very brief here, uh, but that's a discussion I'd be very happy to, to pursue later on. Uh, out of the three pillars I mentioned, grow, attract, and retain, the weakness of Jordan is in grow. Okay? As it is for many countries in the, in the region, it is the ability to train people in both vocational skills and what we call global knowledge skills at home. Uh, the, uh, the most talented people, students, <coughs> have to go abroad, get an education, and then there's no guarantee that they would come back. A number of them are still attracted to public sector jobs, which puts additional pressure on the private sector. But Jordan, being a small economy, also has the agility that bigger economies in the region uh, don't have. So we see many examples um, whereby sometimes pushed by uh, geography, or pushed by demography, or pushed by politics in the, in the region, uh, Jordan has proved that uh, innovation is part of the mantra. Uh, the high number of refugees, for instance, creates additional pressure on the economy and creates some model behavior for many countries, not just in the region, but in the world. Uh, I know that in my own part of the world, in Europe, we look very much at what Jordan is doing about refugees, because there is uh, pressure on the migration uh, side. Um, Overall, as I mentioned before, uh, Jordan is in the average. That is, it's right in the middle of the ranking globally and right in the middle of the ranking in the, in the region, which means that there is a lot of room for improvement, um, in particular on the data front. If you look at the report, you will see that uh, there's a number of uh, variables for which the, uh, the data for Jordan is not available. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if a statistical effort were made, actually the ranking would go up. There's a lot of good data that we don't, uh, we don't track. Um, but that's just one, one example. I think uh, the basic message we want to push about talent competitiveness is that those who have succeeded have been open economies. And Jordan is clearly one example of an eco open economy in the region. Patricia, maybe um, well, there's just on the recommendation. Well, there's one thing I, I just wanted to mention, and um, I may ask Bruno to, to expand on it, is that for all the countries in the region, when you look at the, the relative to their income level, when we, when we compare how are they doing on talent competitiveness, for all of them, there's room for them to, to move up to the mean in terms of there's a great opportunity for them to spend their funding throughout the whole spectrum of talent um, more efficiently and um, more effectively. Do you want to comment on that, Bruno? Because I think it's an important point. The, uh, thank you, Patricia. It is indeed a, a critical point. If you look at page, uh, I forgot which page, somewhere in the report, you will see a big bubble chart and there's a, a line going in the middle. And the line is actually uh, where your performance is expected to be uh, if it were dictated by your level of wealth. In, in, other, in other words, if your country is a rich country, uh, let, let's take the United Arab Emirates, which has a high income per capita, you would expect the talent performance to be that high. If you are uh, Yemen or Algeria in the same region, you would expect the talent performance to be lower for obvious reasons related to capital endowment, universities, etc. So if you're a country below that line, it means there is room for improvement. There are clearly things that can be done better that should push the ranking higher. And one thing which we see in the whole region is that all countries, the 12 countries, are below the line. Okay? And that tells us that probably with little effort but put in the right place, the improvement could be quite spectacular. Jordan is one of the countries fairly close to that line. So it shows that it is one country in which the tools at hand have been used better than in other parts of the, the region. But it's still uh, raises the issue of what is the path for progress, what can be improved. Uh, 
And climate for business, for instance, uh, can be improved on the regulatory side is considered fairly stable for foreign investors. So Jordan will keep attracting uh, foreign investors. But there's a number of things in terms of, uh, you know, how much time it uh, requires to hire or fire somebody, how much time it takes to implement a contract, all these type of things which have nothing to do with neither technology nor talent management per se may improve the overall performance. So let me just, uh, to yeah, I just want to add uh, one thing because you mentioned uh, private-public uh, partnerships. Yeah. I, I think there is something, uh, another P which is missing here is private-public people partnerships. So you have consumers today who have a, a, with the, with the, with a lot of power, you know, newfound power. They are they are they are uh, mobile, uh, uh, working, uh, walking. Uh, eating, sleeping, data generating creatures. And this data is rich. And uh, I think in Jordan, you have a very rich uh, uh, human uh, uh, capital uh, in terms of individuals. And if you engage them more as users in, into this uh, partnership, you'll be surprised what can uh, be there. Now, there is one thing on the critical path of in engaging more the consumers, it's the connectivity. And um, therefore, you know, I would really encourage to have uh, in that intermediary space that we talked about, uh, uh, internet for all uh, of high quality. And you'd be surprised what can come out of it. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, uh, you know, when we say in the intermediary sp uh, space, you have the labor market, we say digitize the labor market, but please, we beg you, don't digitize the problems. So it is an opportunity to actually rethink uh, the, the processes, make them simpler, because you know data natives they love that they 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 they'll be able to embrace it uh, and embrace disruption and change for the better. Uh, and Jordan is really ready to uh, to do that. And I would even add the rest of the region is very much ready. And this is why going back, Lara, to your question, this is why we're we're here because we're optimistic about the future. And we had actually an Internet for All press conference earlier today. So um, we yeah. did talk also about this topic here, the World Economic Forum. Um, we have actually reached uh, the, the end of the press conference um, since we started late. Um, is there any last question? We could maybe do a quick answer. Yes, please, here. Yeah. Hi, Michael Fahey from the National Newspaper. Um, there was one, there were a couple of figures in the report that interested me on the level of people outside of the workforce, 44% outside of the GCC and 64% within the GCC. I believe that's mainly because of uh, the lack of women in the workforce. Uh, I just wanted to know how you go about improving that and how do you go about improving the attractiveness of private sector jobs in GCC countries where there are so many expats? Okay. Who would like to? Um, uh, again, <laughs> a, a critical and powerful question at the, the last minute of the exercise, so we have to be very, <laughs> very short. But this is exactly the, the type of issue that is behind this report. This is why we have this report. There is an obvious problem. There is uh, a youth bulge, um, the uh, Generation Y coming, uh, which is an asset for the region, and a huge gap in terms of employment. So, And you, you quoted the, uh, the figures. So. It's time for action. Uh, what is missing? What is missing is the um, uh, moving away from an entitlement mentality, which makes it a tradition to look for jobs in the public sector. Jobs in the public sector should be encouraged. It should be attractive. But it should not be at the detriment of private sector initiatives. Um, identifying heroes, role models, Young people will start with, uh, Selim mentioned earlier, you know, an app that's become successful, everybody wants to use, and herald this success, show that it can happen. That, that will be a powerful magnet for talent in the, uh, in the region. And the third one on the gender side, uh, we see a number of situations around the world, and uh, no region is an exception. In Europe, for instance, uh, until the end of secondary studies, girls are performing better than boys in terms of STEM, science, technology, and mathematics. And yet you look at engineers, you look at the IT sector, the proportion of male is much higher than that of female. What is going on? There is somewhere a perception that these careers are not rewarding. They are not socially 
uh, rewarded for, for women. This is a, a, question, a cultural issue that can, be, uh, that can be addressed, and Jordan is one of the countries in which we see uh, a number of uh, positive <coughs> results in that area. But the most important <coughs> is the point that both uh, Patricia and Selim mentioned before. This is a young region. Uh, so youth unemployment is the key issue to be, to be addressed. And we talk about Generation X and Generation Y. I still believe that you know, people are, why, why? Why the letter Y? I think the answer is this, in this region. Uh, generation Y is Generation Yalla. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just can I add a quick point yes. to that? Just I think I think we're moving towards it because if you look at let's say GCC budgets, they they're not going to be able to sustain a huge public sector workforce for the next ten years, given the prices of oil. So we've already started to see some some freezes in Saudi in terms of public sector salaries, but it's still about seventy percent more pay in the public sector versus the private sector. And there needs to be this discussion between the public and private sector about how to bring that equilibrium down. Um, I would also say just one quick thing on the private sector side. I think we also have to put the onus on the private sector as well to be more proactive in hiring nationals and and um, and expats that may be in, in the country in things like internships. So historically, private sector rarely offer internships because they see it as too costly and too time consuming. Um, and that, that attitude also has to change because in other markets, it's very traditional that you, you're entering into some private sector companies is through internships while you're still at university. And those are almost non-existent here. Tell him anything you would like uh, to ask before we close? Yes, because I think it's, it's uh, uh, you asked specifically about the GCC uh, and of course the, 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 the classical answer would be make it less attractive to work in the, in the public sector. But what if we do something different and uh, uh, if you provide uh, broadband, massive broadband, to everyone. Uh, the youth, the, we say that this region is growing younger, so by the day, uh, and they will astonish you what <coughs> they can do. We, we know that, for instance, we have um, YouTube creators who left their day job to actually be full-time doing uh, YouTube creation, and, and this is it's a brave new world, brand new uh, opportunities where actually equal men and women are participating there. I, I'll also give you an example, not uh, from from uh, uh, Google, but actually I heard here uh, the Karim story in, in Saudi Arabia. They provided a platform to 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 help, uh, as you know, uh, transport, and, and then all of a sudden they create 250,000 jobs, a and 70,000 of them are in the GCC in Saudi Arabia. They are Saudis, so this was like it was unheard of uh, a few years ago, and that's. I would say the, the, the transformational power when you put technology easy to use uh, together uh, of high quality, you, if, you, if you put it in, uh, in touch with, with use, then things, things, extraordinary things can happen. And I remind you that uh, the Wall Economic Forum did um, select 100 startups that we featured here at the summit. So I think that's also part of, of, of that whole story. So thank you very much to our distinguished panels today. Thank you for coming here to this press <coughs> conference and, and uh, hope you have a, a nice uh, end of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.